The Charles Dickens novel, A Tale of Two Cities, begins with a very famous line. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Hello and welcome to On The Record, I'm your host Jerome Sawyer. Grand Bahama and Abaco have certainly seen far better days prior to Dorian. But for many who reside there, 10 months after Hurricane Dorian, the worst is certainly behind them. But they are still hoping for better days. In this edition of On The Record, a return to Grand Bahama 10 months later. to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. And welcome back. For two days in September, Grand Bahama endured the worst hurricane in history. The eastern end of the island and parts of Freeport were a sea of flood waters and ferocious winds. The damage was mind-boggling. It was the worst of times for the people in these areas. Even now, there is an obvious difficult struggle on the road to recovery. Three mornings per week, cars pull into the Jubilee Cathedral in Freeport for a drive-by breakfast pickup. About 300 people get a hot meal each day from this church. Ten months after Hurricane Dorian and volunteers are here helping with a very basic need. People could have come and get a tuna, corned beef, or sausage, or sausage, the behemoths to say. <laughs> so we, we just wanted to give back and help our community during this time because even a lot of our members have lost their jobs. So many families uh, around here have been affected. So we have people just coming from off the streets as they go to work. Some who don't have a job, they were coming in just to get uh, breakfast. Some who were blind. Uh, we got some reports from persons who were just, uh, who could not move, who were disabled and unable to come here. So what we've been doing was every morning from eight o'clock to 9.30, we try to facilitate uh, the breakfast program here. Not only we were doing here, but we have another branch in Eight Mile Rock. So also, uh, those who couldn't get here in Freeport, uh, we allowed them to go down to Harbourware Shopping Center where they was getting at least 250 meals per day. Many are still without power, living under damaged roofs, in compromised homes, without jobs. Uh, some of them were the sole breadwinners for their families of six, of five, and, you know, they don't have anything to eat. Our food is the most essential need. So we figure if we can reach that area, then at least we can help them somehow to even push along. So with the food, also some building supplies, also our power, some of our seniors, we just try to help them as well too. Uh, some persons who came from Abaco just try to assist them to go back uh, home as well too. Uh, and those initiatives as well, we try to help in that area. So just trying to do a little part is maybe small, but just trying to reach as many people as we can right here. The church was not designated as a shelter, but became a place of refuge as the circumstances of last September turned deadly. And we had to open up our doors to persons who were blind. We had to open up our doors to animals. We had to open up our doors to persons, uh, other persons with disabilities. And uh, we had about 400 people just in here, just running from across the road. We had members who almost drowned trying to get here uh, in their vehicles. And every time it seems like it gets a little different, uh, different and difficult uh, with that. But even with that, we still have that hope, even thank God that God is still keeping us even in the midst of it. You know, whilst there are challenges, we still see that we were able to still assist people. So even in that, it give persons hope that, hey man, don't give up, keep pushing. This is not the end of the story. You're gonna bounce back. You may have lost everything, but it may take a little bit longer, but you're gonna get there. 
you're going to get there. And even through this, we have seen whereby now we became more our brothers and sisters keeper. So we started to look out. You, uh, we would have persons who come here uh, in the morning for breakfast. And what they would do is they would carry some meal for maybe their neighbor. And we allow them to do that. We don't care who you are. Once you're hungry, you're free to come. Two months shy of the first anniversary of this monster storm and the lives like homes here remain shattered. Brana Mae Cooper barely escaped with her life from her home in Gambia Point, a small community in East Grand Bahama. She helps to run a mentoring and empowerment program for young ladies in East Grand Bahama. They have virtual meetings every Saturday. So every Saturday on Zoom, we meet with the young ladies um, for about two hours. And we try to, um, I guess, let it be some continuity where it is that we still have our guest speakers coming on and sharing with them um, people who are locally. The advantage now is that we can get persons who are even out of the country who are experts in their fields, um, you know, through networking. And I was able to pull on some, or I, am, I am able to pull on some, you know, personal friends of my own who are experts in their fields who may live um, anywhere around the world and um, it's it's just going awesome I think I think that I, I know that the program is, is really benefiting these young ladies most of the 20 odd participants struggle with the loss of homes and possessions a lot of them I understand would have left the the area you know the actual hurricane passing up the hurricane but when they return home you know lost everything and you know for for adults you know me being a survivor or myself and knowing what that feels like I can only imagine um, what these young girls you know who you know have clothes and shoes and and school uniforms who just was purchased books and these sort of things you know the personal possessions those kind of things it's difficult for a young person that's apart from the physical loss of, of, of home and belonging it's just wondering what's next because really when you see some of the homes well now now a lot of progress have been made for some of the homes but a lot of them are still at the foundation like just just where it was right after the hurricane and you know just being hopeless to some extent but the area we are a close knitted community um, and communities and um, faith is a major major part and that, that has always, you know, kept, kept us, and I'm sure that's what's keeping a lot of them. But she too is struggling to recover, having had to leave the country for three months. Well, actually, my children left before I did, and I think that was, that was one of the first um, issues or things that I had to deal with, emotional issues that I had to deal with as a mother, um, my children, uh, of course, agreed, agreed, just for them to be healthy in mind and not have to go through the initial phase of all of this. But I guess what it has been is, I, I do recall days after the hurricane, well, the, the following day, or let's just say two days later, no one. We saw like helicopters, helicopters you know, flying around, like, like, geez, like this felt like a war zone. It looked like a war zone. Um, no help, you know, no, okay, even though at some point it was advised that residents were to leave, okay, nobody's coming, this is a punishment to us then, for some of us who are here, who stayed, what is it, okay, maybe there's no place to land, um, we don't know, that kind of thing, but I can, I mean, in all fairness, I don't know how soon the help came, because in another two weeks I was off island, um, but I do know, of course, you know, um, people share their stories that you had nonprofit organizations. I know one that were the first responders were like Rotary. Rotary, they galvanized their people and they came to the aid of us in East Grand Bahama. And I think that was one of the initial things. That she recalls that in those months right after the storm, the assistance from nonprofit organizations was overwhelming. For the most part, a lot of food was coming in. And we were like, okay, we, we, we appreciate it. You know, because you don't want to turn it down, but at the same token, we're trying to get back into our home. So um, it was just trying to find some, I don't know, diplomatic, grateful way to say, okay, <laughs> could you eat up on the food? We need, we need some building supplies. And again, they came, they came to the aid. 
I don't know what the numbers are in terms of the government and was was you know donated and all of that kind of thing. It was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. Just people who just came. They, I remembered, even when the rebuilding, you had, um, you had some nonprofits that came in and they was like and not net not always like contractors like certified all of that but they can put up a sheet rock they can do you know certain things and they did it women men everyone just just came and they came to to our aid so it was so interesting to see <clears throat> that these people came in they help and then like you as the homeowner you can be there helping yourself and that that was always a good thing but to the contrary, things like debris removal hasn't been as efficient. In certain communities, um, some communities you'll see where it's done um, nearly 90%, some, yeah, really, you know, like a community like High Rock. High Rock, a lot of the homes were gone, so you would see vacant properties. And for me, um, even though I live in Gambia Point, High Rock is where I grew up. Like, that's where my family home was. And... It's unrecognizable. Like you can literally go in one area and you can see all the way out to it's it's the landscape has totally, totally changed. I think it's more emotional. For me, it's more emotional and for a lot of people that I've spoken to, it's like, yeah, we're rebuilding and it's home. So we're gonna rebuild. But we are hopeful. We are hopeful that, you know, more descendants of East Grand Bahama would now return home and rebuild the area. What's the rebuilding been like? The rebuilding, I know for the majority of the people, um, just basically waiting on um, assistance from the government, um, because there, there were some, I'm sure, that had um, few that might have had home insurance, that, that was few and far apart, some that might have had minimal savings, that kind of thing. But a lot of people waiting on assistance from the government because they were told that it was coming and all of that. In the past, she says, East Grand Bahama was the forgotten area. But she sees this as an opportunity, given all the attention. For one of the first times, I think, in history, East Grand Bahama is on the map. People are knowing that there is an East Grand Bahama, you know, um, for the most part. Um, and this is our time for people to see that we are a resilient group of people, that we, yes, this, this tragedy that has happened, and it's not some demonic force or something like that. This is a natural occurrence, and however you want to take that, whichever angle you want to come from with that, the bottom line is, is that how are you going to maximize? Because there are a lot of things that we lack as a people, as a community, um, not not to be political in any in any sense, but the realities are the realities. There are a lot of things that that should be in East Grand Bahama that that non-existent, and why? Well, I guess the, that's still left to be answered, you know. So this is our time to to express what we feel, what we need, and make sure that it happens. And really, for us not to wait on people to come and give it to us or ask if we need it. Let's go and say that we need X, Y, Z. We need our schools to be rebuilt in East Grand Bahama. We need our medical facility. We had a clinic prior to. We need a, a, a more state of the art. Our, our population in East Grand Bahama, well, I mean, a lot of our senior citizens now are, you know, dying and all of that. But why is it that we have to travel miles and miles into the city for some, I mean, yeah, we have the basic medical care, but a lot can be done. Why We, we are voters too. We are residents. We, we deserve it. And when we come back, a look at progress in some East Grand Bahama communities. Plus, a little later on, Sweeting's key residents say they've been forgotten. Stay with us. Welcome to On The Record. Looking for more On The Record? If you miss our Thursday showing at 8 p.m., join us for the re-airing on Friday mornings at 10, and then again each Sunday night at 8.30. Or go to our YouTube channel and catch up on all of our past episodes. And then like our Facebook and Instagram pages for preview of upcoming shows and get a chance to ask your questions. 
just look for On The Record. Welcome back to On The Record. This segment is brought to you by Executive Printers. East Grand Bahama has been a focal point for the hurricane recovery effort. From the very beginning, we knew this area would take a while to recover, if ever fully. Most afternoons, Preston Cooper Sr. and his wife are under their gazebo at their Gambier Point home. While the natural sea breeze is inviting, it's where they come to unwind and escape the realities of life under reconstruction. They lost everything in their home, including two vehicles. Flood waters forced them into the roof of their house, where they rode out the storm for seven hours. But he's optimistic that things are turning around. We survived by God's grace. The grace of God, we survived. But it was hard. You know, we use our resources because we haven't yet no help from government yet. But it's on the way. Because I get a voucher approved yesterday. So, and then we, another thing, we gain with power. Now we're getting power by moving this thing, so we should have power. So, you know, making a generator, that's what we had. <laughs> And gas, that's about $250 a week for gas. Man, it was rough. Now, now that you see the progress, you see the, the workers who are here restoring the lines, you got approval for some stuff, you got in your bus back. How do you feel now? I feel much better. Thank God. Much better. <laughs> Help us on the way. Did you feel like you all were abandoned? Uh, yeah, we have, we have, yes. I'll be honest with you, yes. But it take a long time, you see? Because plenty of people, man. I think my watch room must have been uh, almost like 4,000 people, 3,000 people ahead of me, something like that. So it take a long time. On the day we visited, he took us to his backyard farm, which is again flourishing. He says it's helped him to pass the time, waiting on the power to be restored to the area. And once you get power, be straight. <laughs> <laughs> He's straight, man. <laughs> That's it. He smells my pocket. <laughs> McLean's town looked like a war zone when we first visited shortly after Hurricane Dorian. There was enormous structural damage, many missing, presumed dead. Isaiah McIntosh was fortunate to make it out alive. You were in right. here during the hurricane? Right, and the whole thing blew down. Okay. I escaped through the roof. Got out through the roof. Yeah. Okay. The bank came from the north east. Mm -hmm. Took me all the way back to the east. The strong sea surge took his home apart and swept him into another nearby home. Yes, yes, right there. Uh -huh. The tide took you over there. The tide took you over there. No, just beyond there. Wow. Yep. A friend of mine found me the next morning. So he found you the next morning? Mm -hmm. wow. His home now being built through assistance with a small home repair program and other charitable organizations. McIntosh is one of the beneficiaries of the small home repair program. While he's been approved for $10,000 towards rebuilding, thus far he's gotten the majority of his help from charity groups and family. But back at the office of the Disaster Reconstruction Authority, hundreds of applications are being processed to try and get their homes repaired and rebuilt. It starts with registering with drabahamas.org. And once you go through the process, you get assigned an agent. Once you assign the agent, the agent contacts you, contacts you and lets you know, hey, all of your documents are in. 
if all of your documents are not in, they would try and help you to get your documents. And so, so that can be a part of the process that can be prolonged. Once the homeowner does not have everything, that can kind of prolong the process. So we urge homeowners to have all their documents when applying. For those who are not, doesn't have the ability to go online and apply, we invite them to come into, we have two offices, one in Grand Bahama and one in Abaco. So you can come into our office and our, our agents will be willing to help you. So we're at the Harold Gregory building downstairs at the back and then we're at the government complex in Marshall. And for those needing to come in, well, it's all there, right in front of you. When the woman comes in and they sit down, they start to look around and they start to ask questions. Oh, this is what I'm able to get. Okay, I need this. I need proof of citizenship. I need proof of ownership. And it's re easy to read. So they get to see where they can contact us. They can see what else I need or what other questions. And it also helps us as, uh, as, as we're on the phone calling the homeowners and they ask a question, we can look at the wall and we could say, hey, okay, there's no mobilization for a tradesman if they ask. Despite what appears to be a pretty straightforward process though, there are some delays in processing. The biggest issue is proving ownership. Well, one of the things is the ownership documents. We know a lot of homeowners in the rural areas of Grand Bahama, they don't have um, like land papers because they were on generation lands and stuff like that. So we have provided them with the ability to get an affidavit with an affidavit stating that they were on this land during this time. Also like with um, like a lot of people been off the grid. So we work with them and we find out, hey, were you actually living on this land? Do you have neighbors that can verify this information? So we only have a few documents that you need, only maybe three or four documents the most. So you need your passport. You need an NIB card if possible, or a second ID to verify information, because it is an online process. We ask that you provide proof of ownership and then a bill of some sort, a utility bill to say that you were living there. And even finding homeowners is challenging. Um, we have homeowners that we are trying to get in contact with and we can't reach them because we don't know how to find some of these individuals. We're trying to reach out to different members of the of the community to say, hey, um, if you know this neighbor, come and reach out to us. But the progress is evident. We have executed over 2,000 purchase orders just in the Freeport area. Um, and in Abaco, we have executed over 800 purchase orders. Um, I would say the Abaconians have been slow to apply and we, we are going to initiate a program there. On July 20th, we'll be heading over to Abaco to initiate an RV. But the RV will start in Grand Bahama as well, and we'll be working from east to west. This RV will be equipped with, with uh, agents to help the persons in the areas to get registered online. So when we get to Abaco, we'll be able to assist homeowners in the different areas who don't have the electricity or the means to get registered online. So we're going to the people. The government has also used this rebuilding to try and help stimulate local economies. Construction businesses and contractors are heavily involved, and that means money and jobs. I've seen where we have increased the amount of vendors and contractors into the program, builders, even somebody that you know can do the work, we have included them into the program. So we see how it has benefited a lot of homeowners, and um, especially with with getting materials. You see, we have vendors that you can get materials from. Not every then there has everything that the homeowner might want or need, but we, we see a, a real spillover into the community at large. And on the other side of this break, Sweeting's key residents say little has happened by way of recovery for them. We decide to visit the area and see for ourselves. Welcome to On the Record in a balanced, true, and open debate you've been looking for. Thank you for staying with us. This segment is brought to you by Grand Bahama Power. Most, if not all, of the residents of Sweeting's Key say they will never ride out another storm on that small key. 
But for many who call this small island their home, real tragedy is still with them. Sweetings Key has earned the reputation as the fishing capital of Grand Bahama. This small community was a thriving town where most people made a living on the sea. Normally, they would be preparing for the start of another lucrative crawfish season. But Dorian changed all that. Ten months after the storm, little has been done to restore lives in this community. There is still no power, no running water. Much of the debris still remains in place. And the only thing that's in abundance here is frustration. Right now, my trap, I even can't put a trap. The trap stems on the line, I ain't getting no trap over nice some of the some of the season I wake I have plenty traps. This time of the year is be really happy for everybody getting ready to both paint up and ready for this getting ready for the crawfish season. Very good. Everybody happy and seeing the see hoping the season coming, everybody putting on traps and ready for the season. Not be, trying to make money. Yeah, for that big catch. Right now I can't do nothing. I ain't get no veil. When we have our thirty boats up and running, Sweetens Key alone is put it up. 4,500 pounds a conch a day and more. So what means we, we here can, can produce like 22,000 and change a week in conchs. And to have a village like Sweetens Key, not up and running with engines on the boats, you know, I wanted to say to those um, leaders out there who need to make it happen, we need to step up to make sure that Sweetens Key generator is running well. We can put money into the treasury and not just go out there for a hunt out, but to be able to go out and fish and we don't have to go into Freeport to look around for rental assistance and food assisting, but we would be able to put money there. So I'm saying to the leaders out there, whether it's our government or whoever out there helping, please step in and help Sweeten Ski so we don't have to you know, keep on looking for hunt outs. It's frustration that's shared by dozens of fishermen here like Zendel Tate, who 10 months ago lost his boat and livelihood. Going upside down, broke up, and now it's I already done repaired for, repair for it. So now what I need is a motor. And they told me, the rotary store, they said, you're supposed to have a motor for me, but there ain't nothing showing up yet. And I said, but August, I ain't had a lick now from September to now. And that's how you make your living? That's how I make my living. That's how I make my living from fishing and lobster and conking. Mm -hmm. So how have you been surviving if you can't go out to fish um, um, and lobster and conk, how you survive? The little I had to the bank, I was drying off up and down and moving up and down and that's right now but dry. Totally dry. I have nothing. I went to the social service, they give me $80 one day and that's about it. I had nothing else, no other way. And right now I have nothing. So I need some kind of help, some kind of how to do what I need to be done. Right now my trap, I even can't put no traps. The trap symbols on the line, I ain't get no trap over nice some of the some of the season I wake I have plenty traps. Right now I have nothing. I can't get out to set nothing. Eleanor Tate's home was also destroyed by Dorian. She opted to evacuate but returned to nothing but a foundation. We had a five bedroom house and everything was smack and smooth, you know, here on this community. And if actually it's actually been like a transform here because knowing that what we had and when we came back here everything was just flat you know what I mean looking at this now all I see is tents it seems nothing has happened here in the 10 months since the hurricane no nothing has happened as yet you know we are pleading to the government to come and help us desperately because we are living in a tent and when weather come we have to run for our lives. You know, my experience here, I have changed like five, ten since I came back home in the month of April. And when weather come, I have to run. You know, the tent has fell down a couple of times and, you know, I never give up. I continue to stay here and actually with my people and want to see that better for this community. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my brother, we are here. He's living in one tent. I'm living in one, but we're still holding on and hoping for the government to come and help us. She's applied for and been cleared for assistance with the small home repair program. Problem is, she can't rebuild until all the debris is cleared. But we are waiting on the tractors to come actually to push down because we cannot do it by hand to clean up the property and the area for us to move forward at rebuilding. Okay, so small home repair will assist you with rebuilding. What are you going to do, you know, you're going to go back to the same five bedroom or what are you going to do? No, so we're just going to do something simple for me and my mom 
and my brother because my mom this is like 90 years of age now so i want her back home before she passed out this world that she can come back here because she she pleading every day that she wants to come home like so many others in the community each day is a battle for basic survival the only thing we do is try to encourage one another here because it isn't easy and actually to stay focused and knowing that God is able to restore back what we had lost and better. You know, so I just stay here in my tent, read my Bible daily as I could when I'm not doing my livelihood. And you know, it's so, it's so awesome that I can look at the water because it is a peace of mind that kept me safe and actually keep me calm at this time. At this time, we are using a generator. We have to go into Freeport to get gas and we are getting water from, actually from the water plant we use our trolley, which is rigged there, and we put our buckets in and we go in the back and fill them up with water and bring them out for us to bathe, wash, whatever we have to do with them. So you still don't have running water at this time either? No, at this pressing time, but they are working on the water system. So hope, hopefully soon that it'll be running back to our homes that who actually have a home that, you know, we can get water back. Her brother Wilbert has managed to get his boat back on the water with a second-hand engine. We found him repairing his boat steering column on the roadside. It's where we talked about his hurricane experience after his roof blew off. When I came out my home, me and my brother, the water's catching me over here, that's my chest. I couldn't see a thing, it was black dark. And I walked down the road. No, when I came with those, I look up and I look down face, the direction where I can go. And I walk, I walk down the road. And the current is pulling so strong in the road. I walk down Mr. Cooper, Nolan Cooper. I meet him face. And he really can assist me because the place building is full of water too. So I went down by Barry Cooper. He rescued me, you know. It was terrible, man. He's a stroke survivor as well, with no use of his right hand. And yet, he's had to manage in these very harsh conditions. Well, it wasn't easy, you know. It wasn't easy. You know, you, know, you can't give up, you know. It wasn't easy. You know, you get people came around, you know, foreigners, come bring out food, bring out water. You know, help out pretty well, you know. And I try to help myself too, you know. And I keep it going, going, you know. You still going out fishing? Yeah, when I could, <laughs> when I could, you know. I lost a whole engine. That was a whole engine I lost. I gotta go and buy another engine, you know. It wasn't brand new, it was just something I got to put together, you know, get myself going. And you make a living from fishing? Yeah, that's my living. Before I had a stroke, you know, got a moron strong and and still, you are fishing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and still. He's gotten a little help, he says. He remains optimistic that better days are coming. A, a little, you know, a little, a little, you know, a little, not much. Because you get to see, you still live in the tent, you know. <laughs> a little, but help is on the way, you know. You feel like it's on the way? Yeah. I feel it's on the way. I can feel it. Fellow fisherman Wilton Duncombe is not so understanding. We need some help in thinking. Please, Mr. Sawyer, when you go back to Nassau, tell Mr. Miller, please, we need plenty of help here in Swinkie, sir. We need people to help us, because there's nothing to win. What do you think we do right now? They go smuggling to do something with the way, illegal, because nothing happened right now. See ya? They have some, the creek, and the thing, ain't nothing selling. Look at them, look at them. The fellas over there, son, yeah, to clean up the community, they're not doing a good job. I don't know why the, the minister, who is the prime tribe, is giving these people the money, the mess up, especially our swing king. There's nothing happening on swing king. I see from West End, the the McLean's son. Be in the bar city, Mr. Sawyer. Please, when you get back to the Nassau, please tell Mr. Minister. If he can handle the job, please step down and get those. Because right now, we're in tragedy. As he grows more and more impatient, the events of 10 months ago are still fresh in his mind. Sometimes my heart gets full like I think, right? But you all come here, they give nothing permission that help us on the way. 
Nolan Cooper is also dealing with the horrific events of Dorian. A strong moving storm surge trapped him and two others in an upstairs room. And when we go upstairs and walk around to get into the room, this room right here, the stairs then collapse. And after that, the only thing we could do, or what I was doing was pray. Because I, we didn't know, I, to me and myself, I didn't thought it would have come like that. But like I tell people, that line over there helped us a lot too, even though the water came over that. It helped us a lot. And right now, if I hear one coming and that's a category one, I go on. Like many others in Sweetings Key who rode out the storm here, he says no matter what, next time around, he's evacuating. Based on this experience, he sees storms as getting worse. The temperature of the water was hot, really hot, because as it's going, as died. And I was I was sweating my goggles, so the you were sweating in the water? Was it <laughs> in my goggles? That so that temperature was at least in the sea eighty to ninety uh, degrees. So that make a big difference. That's that's a fuel for fire, as those people say. That's what deal with the battle. Ten months later he too is concerned that so little has happened to get the key back up and running. Right now for me to really keep my composure and keep doing, the only thing I do, if I'm safe, I'm going in the boat, I look at this, and I'll have to walk on the outside to catch myself, because looking at this is still, I don't know. And right now, whoever they send back in here to clean up, they need to have the equipment that's coming here and do what they gotta do, because right now, to build, you need water. The water isn't running like that. So, and current wires, I don't know. I mean, they say by next month, but they got to come in here and they got to, they can have to replant some of these for, mm -hmm. I don't mind how it is. And you need, I see a lot of debris still here, so you still need a lot of heavy, you need heavy equipment, heavy eh? Equipment, heavy equipment, heavy, heavy equipment. Because most of the things where they have, they have a bunch of junk on the ball bar. The wooden stuff, people could have burned them. They were saying don't buy. Um, they didn't want. To. I buy what I got. What most of my own. But and things like that, mm -mm, you gotta do that. The problems in Sweetings Key are pervasive. The residents feel neglected, and with good reason. Sweetings Key really we doesn't have what the rest of the other um, settlement from you know, the missile base come up. Everybody got the big bulldozers, the, the great cleanup movement in Sweetens Key is still looking like the ghost town. And I'm saddened because I have to be, I have to deal with the people every day, Sawyer. Every day I got a telephone call from some resident saying, when our local government is gonna ask the government to help us. Well, I thank God that you are here today so they can know that it ain't local government. You know, we just crying out, and I believe help is coming. But I'm saying to those persons out there, such as the Prime Minister and those other persons who want to help, please, Sweetens Key, we need you here in Sweetens Key to help us. Boaters here need engines. Homeowners need materials. And many of the donations made to East Grand Bahama have yet to make it here. Every time you ask the question, where are the plywoods from these places and the tuba fours and the tuba six, or where's our share of this 500,000 that's supposed to be for East Grand Bahama? And you can't get a real answer in reference to it. All across the key downed power lines and snapped utility poles, indicative of the slow moving restoration of utilities. A statement from the Grand Bahama Power Company on Sweetings Key says Grand Bahama Power will work with the stakeholders on solar and backup power options for the temporary homes to be installed soon on Sweetings Key. Company statement also says we have not received any other applications for power at Sweetings Key. And then there is still the issue of no running water. I had to tote water almost a half a mile to mix concrete. If we're talking about moving fast and moving forward, these problems has to be resolved. 
sun, you got to go and, 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 and tote the sun, tote the water. And, and I'm not putting that on anybody because that's one of the challenge. You know, we want to build back this dream that we had on the rising. I want to tell you, people in Grand Bahama was tired of West End and, and, and Central Freeport. They wanted to come on to Sweet and Ski. They wanted to hang here to the Turtle Park and eat some crock lobster and crock conk and fish that they were getting at a cheap price. So, you know, we, let's get this, let's get this economy here in Sweet and Ski moving where we can help put money back in the treasury. Still to come tonight on this program, we attempt to get some answers on Sweeting's Key and Grand Bahama Power speaks to the restoration. Stay with us. Where in the world is Matt Lauer? Where in the world is Alison Greenslee? The answer is about the low value of cottage and the Atlanta. So we can talk about it. On the record tonight, the government's purchase of the Grand Bouquin is a hot subject in the news. And we are back in this, our final segment. We talk with the Grand Bahama Power Company. We also press the minister responsible for some answers. Grand Bahama has a unique situation in that its utilities are privately operated. Grand Bahama Power Company is reporting steady progress in bringing service back to those areas in the east now 10 months without power. We would have to date energized the main feed from Stat Oil all the way up to just shy of Bevanstown. We would have also energized the communities of Pelican Point and High Rock. We know that COVID-19 would have kind of deterred us a little bit from our restoration plans and efforts where our original goal was to have the communities energized by May, but we are committed to rebuild and restoring the East. We've also procured supplemental crews that will be joining us within the coming days to kind of expedite that restoration and rebuild process. Uh, what about those communities uh, from where you mentioned straight into McLeanstown? Uh, can you give us a timetable on those? So we're working now into next week to work to energize Gambier Point, Turtle Cove, and up to Freetown. Um, it is important to note that we are deploying our resources to the areas where we have received approved permits for applications for power. And so once we're done with Freetown, we will progress towards McLeanstown. We do want to encourage the residents to be reminded that once you do get your Ministry of Works permits, the customer then needs to reach out to us, the power company, to have that request for a temporary power or permanent power, and we will come out and make those connections. But before they can be reconnected, homeowners have to secure some specific approvals. There may be customers that may not be prepared to be connected to the grid. And so what the application process does is it allows us to do our checks and balances before we actually make those connections to the homes and ensure that customers are indeed ready to receive power. Even some areas of Freeport remain without power. There are some customers within um, the Freeport, Central Freeport area that are still working to conduct home repairs and then be connected. Once those repairs are done and we do receive the approvals from the Port Authority, we will work to make those connections to the homes within the Freeport area. The most egregious spot in all of Grand Bahama continues to be Sweeting's Key. It was clear the response here has been slow at best, starting with the removal of the debris. We awarded the contract for the debris connection and removal, first of all. And the contractor, Mr. Penman, that Los Penman at the time had some issues. But being a Grand Bahamian from, from the area, we wanted to empower the locals to work. Um, he didn't have the, all of the relevant equipment. Um, however, um, he did a lot of it manually. Um, and under the circumstances, he did the best that he, that he could. Um, we are presently now moving um, um, to ensure that he has heavy duty equipment and, and they are presently on the way. He, he has secured a low draft barge. Um, so we're looking at leaving from the port of, of, of Equinor, where Equinor um, Earth facility is. There's a ramp there that we'll be loading the heavy duty equipment on to take it over to Sweden Ski. And once you have the, the machinery over there, 
he'll be in a better position to not only collect the debris, but to put them on the barge and to bring them across to the mainland of, of Grand Bahama. So a, a part of the, of, of, the, of the reason for the delay was pretty much the lack of, of, of logistics with respect to equipment um, collection and, and transportation. But we are confident that over the next two to three weeks, you'll see a significant um, difference in, the, in the, the collection of debris on Sweden's ski. While the government must rely on private companies to restore the utilities here, residents become impatient. Ten months later, and the people of Sweeting Ski are frustrated that they still have no water. And again, we do not only want to plan what was there, we want to ensure that we design a proper system so that moving forward, um, we will have more resilience um, and, and we, we'll have more, more volume of water. Because um, up to the point when we had Hurricane Dorian, we had actually 51 residents residents in um, homes um, in Sweden Ski and we anticipate that that will be a minimum and persons also, also want to go back home. So once we build a more resilient community, we expect the number to go up. So we will in, in turn be, be designing a larger um, water, water system. Unfortunately, um, that doesn't come under the Water Sewers Corporation, it comes under the Grand Bahama Utility Company. So uh, at some point it would be good if, if those two bodies can, can also um, 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 unite and form a coalition where they can have a proper system in there to, to um, uh, I guess, take care of the 51 residents plus um, the ones um, to come. The promise that temporary housing is soon to come for those wanting to return and start rebuilding. So we presently have 20 containers that were secured by MSC, 20, 20 foot containers. And, and again, they will be transported from Equinor um, um, Harbor up to Sweden Ski for installation for persons who would have lost their homes and who wants to go back home to rebuild the community. Um, again, that's those equipment um, arrive on Grand Bahama on the 26th of, of, the, of June. So all of the logistics has been worked out with customs and now we're making um, provisions to transport them over to the island for erection and, and, and eventually for, for um, the construction of the community. And for the fishermen, handicapped by no engines or income. One um, is by the Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources, um, uh, Minister Michael Pintar. He's been very much on the ball, um, understanding what, what the challenges are, and we're making provisions for, for the fishers to be able to access loans, not only to, to get their boats, but to get um, engines. And, and then um, the Rotary Club of, of Grand Bahama, um, they are also um, uh, making provisions along with, with, their, with, their, with their partners to provide engines either at, at, at low cost or at no cost to the fishes. And we're hoping that coming out of this, that the, fishes, uh, the fishermen in that area will form a cooperative where they can work together and not only just um, um, fish for, uh, to, to get enough for their to feed their families, but that can be a way of life. Because Sweden's here have extremely rich fishing ground and, and, and they are very industrious uh, people. But again, not, not having access to cash as, as they would like, having lost all in Dorian. Um, they, they, are, they are receiving assistance from the Bahamas government and from NGOs like the Rotary Club. People of this key say they have every right to feel neglected. Some of the inaction is being blamed on logistics. Um, and I do believe that with the more isolated communities and with the logistics, like I spoke to earlier, having the, the proper machinery over there, having a barging system to get debris or to carry materials there and bring it from, um, from the island um, is a part of, of our learning curve moving forward. So we will now build capacity. Um, there are many lessons coming out of Dorian and we, we've, we've been taking notes so that we can better get to those isolated communities. Um, the the, the, the low-hanging fruit areas right in Grand Bahama where in the city of Freeport where all of the utilities are, where the road network is good, where the harbor is up and running. Um, unfortunately, those areas are serviced first. But we now have to put systems in place and system improvement and strengthening is, a, is, a, is a, one of the pillars that we are focusing on right now so that we can respond in a more quick and more efficient manner to, to get those isolated communities back up to a sense of normalcy and, and, and beyond. So we've, we've learned and uh, I can only say that we want them to remain encouraged. I'm not satisfied with the way, and I don't ever want to be satisfied. And I don't want people to twist this in the wrong way. I'm not satisfied with the progress that we're making. I do believe that if you ever become satisfied, you become complacent, you get into a comfort zone. So I want to be, always want to be uncomfortable and continue to push. If I ever tell you that I'm satisfied, then you know something is wrong with me. So I will never be satisfied with the progress that we've made um, on, on any of the fronts. In the hardship areas, like we've been going to the Keys, and once we uh, did the assessments on the keys, then we would formulate the plan to get the materials onto the keys and add labor components to it. Mm -hmm. It's logistically challenging, but there are vendors who have presented that they can facilitate the, the shipment of goods to the keys.
Meanwhile, there is progress in other parts of eastern Grand Bahama. The priorities, the road work, power and water. The, the first thing was the debris removal, cleaning up and having access. And as, as, as you can see right now, um, we've made tremendous progress in that area. We still have a lot of, of vehicles in East Grand Bahama, as well as, as um, um, City of Freeport um, and, and, and even the Western area. However, in partnership with the Grand Bahama Port Authority, we were able to secure 10 plus acres of land on, on Takari Street, where we will be, be um, pulling derelict vehicles. They are storing them eventually for us to compact them, uh, make, turn them into cubes, in, in, into um, uh, metal, and, and for recycling and maybe in some instances for transport. And even the reconstruction of the High Rock Clinic is promised for the near future. The clinic for the community has already been, been designed and it's going through the approval process with the Ministry of Works now. Um, uh, 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 um, contractors have been identified and, and as soon as, as we um, have the permit in hand, um, of course, the construction will commence. Um, there was a hospital you know, donated to East Grand Bahama by one of our NGOs and that was commissioned um, several months after Hurricane Doran. Um, it is a mobile unit where persons from the various communities, uh, if you can't get to it, in some instances we will we'll have it roving from community to, to community. So understanding that, that there is uh, an issue with health care um, the hospital team is making a big difference and, uh, and of course we're doing our best to expedite the, the reconstruction of the Random Oil Hospital. Dorian has brought many lessons, most in the aftermath, but a seawall at Smith's Point has proven to be a model for the future protection of coastal communities. Oh, this was my first assignment as Parliamentary Secretary um, in the Ministry of Works and, and, and this um, was more than just a seawall, it's a defense system to protect this is one of the oldest communities we have in Grand Bahama, the community of, of, of Smith's Point. Um, we had some issues uh, with, the, with the initial contractor, but we were able to part companies on, on, um, in, 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 in the good stead um, without any major issues. And we rehired an, another local Bahamian company, and we had tight reign over them with respect to the construction. We had, we had tight management. The team from the Ministry of Works um, did their job. Uh, myself, assisted by Ms. Ms. Tony um, um, Hudson Bannister, the minister from, from Nassau, Mr. Desmond Bannister, was here on a regular basis, ensuring that it was done properly. So besides this being a seawall, this was a defense mechanism. We had Dorian that hit Grand Bahama, and not one portion of the seawall was damaged. Now, this is not to say that we can beat God in our nation, but God has given us the wisdom and ability to protect ourselves. And this year should stand as a model moving forward for all seawall um, slash defense mechanism that, that our communities, our coastal communities, will be protected. Not one home was lost as a result of wave action coming beyond the seawall. The final leg of our journey back into Freeport took us here. There are pockets of tragedy throughout Grand Bahama. One such area is Queen's Cove. Neighborhoods here appear as ghost towns, house after house abandoned, quiet, dormant. Only insects and weeds live here now. The overgrown shrubs and bushes help to hide the real destruction unleashed in September's monster storm. All that remains in some cases are remnants of lives, families and memories left behind to rot. Many homes here are uninhabitable. The images tell the stories of the destruction. This is all that is left behind by nature's fury, extensive wall damage, structures completely compromised, and now being reclaimed by the same nature that reduced them to rubble in the first place. It is clear that many families simply walked away from this tragedy with few salvageable possessions. We asked the Minister of State for Disaster Preparedness, Management and Reconstruction, what is to become of the homes in neighborhoods like this? Well, e even with the debris removal, um, there are certain subdivisions in Grand Bahama that were private development, and, and the, development, the developers were responsible for the cleaning. Now, there, there were certain instances where they reneged on their responsibility. They were neglected to do what they were supposed to have done, and the government stepped in. Um, I, I can name several of them, and in Hudson Estate, um, some parts of Heritage. Um, again, you're talking about Queen's Cove, we're making effort now to also clean up in that area. But as a government, even though it was not our primary responsibility, these are our people. 
So we, we've, we've stepped o, o, out of bounds um, to ensure that our people are taken care of. So Queens Cove, it may be, may be behind the curve right now, but we have it on our radar, and those areas will again be addressed. Um, uh, Hudson Estate in the heart of the city of Freeport was done by a private developer. Uh, Malibu Reef, Bahama Terrace, even Bahama Terrace right now, um, there, there are still some debris, and that is the Central Grand Bahama constituency. So we are allowing the, the, um, the developers to go ahead and do what they, what they sh um, should have done. Um, however, as a responsible government, um, I had a conversation with the city of Freeport this week um, with Mr. Luke, Luke Carroll from Sanitation Services, and now we're making efforts now to clean up Bahama Terrace, and, and likewise, we'll do the same thing in, 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 in Queen's School. Now, how the government recovers the money, is another story, but in the meantime, we cannot allow the communities to remain in, 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 in that, that state, state that is in now, um, causing rodents to be built up and, and, and person, even when they rebuild, will, will have more of a treacherous um, um, situation under which you live. Amidst the hardships, slow responses in some areas and progress in others, many here tell me they are optimistic. After all, they are Grand Bahamians. I believe the future is still bright. I believe that with God on our side, we can make it. We don't know what storms are coming next. And many times, sometimes the toll of, of the mental storm take even a greater effect than the physical storm. Because we have persons who are uh, testimonies where people say, you know, every time I hear the wind, I reflect on not Dorian, but Matthew Hurricane. So it shows to the mental state of our people as well, and even how difficult it is for some people to even cope during this time. But I believe even through that we try to get assistance for our people as well and also through the power of prayer through our council as well we try to help them uh, to the necessary areas where persons are just tipping over on the edge because they have lost hope. But I believe today that we still have hope. We still have hope as a resilient group of people. I could tell you today even as a result of us being here today Every time we get ready to shut down the program, a member would come and bring maybe a sack of grits. Someone would bring a leg of uh, sausage. And it shows that, hey, wherever there's vision, there's always provision. And that's why even some people who are hopeless know that God is still there with you. And we will get through this. Well, that will do it for this edition of On the Record. Special thanks to all of the people of Grand Bahama for sharing their stories with us. Also, special thanks to my production and technical teams. And thanks to you, our audience, for tuning in week after week. We'll see you next time, same place, same time, right here on the record. And happy independence. Be sure and stay tuned to this network for live coverage of the National Independence Celebrations.